Okay. Thank you for coming to my talk. It's uh, Ride Sharks. We're going to be talking about ride sharing today. I'm uh, Caleb Brown. You can find me at, at No Good Robot on Twitter. Uh, I've been in technical industry for about 20 years, uh, CISSP, GCIH, GMON, and for this, uh, this talk, uh, really just an UberX driver. Uh, we're going to go through a little bit of history, some of the technology, the privacy, um, what I feel like are some of the attacks that are capable from a ride sharing platform, uh, ways to protect yourself, and then if we have time, uh, a couple stories. Now, ride sharing itself uh, has probably been around since what we understand is the late 1600s. As, as long as somebody's had some way of getting somewhere faster than walking, they've tried to make money off of it. Um, what we understand more of a modern idea of ride sharing really started as a carpool in World War II. It was used as an idea of resource sharing to try to help the war effort. Um, three of these pictures are part of that, and then in the bottom middle you'll see one, uh, the green one there, it kind of says pool it. That was an idea that um, really started again in the 70s during the gas crisis. Uh, the history of modern real-time ride sharing um, pretty much started in 2006 in the UK with a company by the name of Blah Blah Car. Uh, and it was called that because the Blah Blah was the way that the drivers were rated. So it was either Blah was quiet, Blah Blah talked somewhat, and Blah 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 talked too much. Uh, <laughs> as we understand, in the United States, ride sharing really kind of started in 2010 with Uber as a black car service. Uh, in 2011, they started uh, UberX, and then kind of went off to the races from there with Lyft starting in 2012. One of the later entries um, in 2014 was the taxi industry trying to get involved uh, also with real-time ride sharing as it's starting to really hurt their business. Um, as of 2018, these are 72 different examples uh, ride-sharing companies around the world. Um, a lot of them are localized and are specialized in what services they offer. Um, this really also goes into the history of ride-sharing. You could see when ride-sharing started in 2014 as of second quarter of this year to understand what's happening to the rental car business and the taxi business because of ride-sharing. Uh, it's absolutely eating their lunch. Now, technology-wise, uh, who here has used rideshare? Show of hands, pretty much everybody. Is there anyone here who's never used a rideshare? Okay, any specific reasons why? Okay, cool. Neat. All right. So, pretty much everybody's familiar with the technology then. It's... Um, Real-time ride-sharing was not really capable. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> um, so it requires, it requires uh, smartphone technology. Uh, it really wasn't capable of till then. Um, and also with selective error rate of GPS being lowered in the 90s, that also made it possible. Uh, right now, about half of all Americans probably have a ride-share app on their phone. doesn't necessarily mean that they use it. Um, about 5.5 million people a day, about 2 billion rides a year in total. Um, this industry is not going away as much as um, municipalities or states are trying to control it now. Uh, the average length of the career for a driver is somewhere between half a year and a year, maybe longer, but the churn rate is exceedingly high on it. So privacy. It's, it, it, I see it as a problem with the industry. Um, Companies like Uber have struggled with it also. Um, from the rider's perspective, I know a lot about you, especially if I'm working certain hours. I know where you live, I know your schedule, and with a little bit of social engineering, I could pretty much figure out who you are and what you do for this company. Now the thing I won't know about you probably is your phone number. Most of these apps now actually give fake phone numbers. So if I'm a driver and I can't find you and I'm calling you through the app, I'll get, a, I'll get a temporary number so I won't know it. Now, certain services like Uber Select, which is a, a higher-end Uber, uh, you'll have a lot of passengers that will try to get your phone number because they want you to be their personal driver. Um, but beyond that, you don't really know anything about me beyond what the app tells you. Now, there's some background checks that go into that, but there's some arguments about 
if they truly engage with local law enforcement. Now, most of the, the, the two large companies of Uber and Lyft have really tried to step up their uh, background check game uh, to the point now where I believe if they aren't doing it now, by the end of this year, they're going to start doing real-time scrapes for deep possible DUI charges and other issues. It may only be on a local level that they wouldn't normally see with whatever background check they use. So from the attack perspective, this is where it gets interesting. This is a map of some of my war driving activities here in Louisville. So as an Uber driver, I have been war driving. Um, so it's going to be grumpy because I'm not connected to the internet. This is just a sample of some of my war driving data. I can't really put it all into Google Maps because the KML just crushes the application. Um, this was all harvested. Oh. Sorry about that. This is all harvested with a $150 uh, Dell laptop from Best Buy some U and some USB Wi-Fi card and a USB GPS. I saw. You know, the numbers are on the screen here, for, uh, 4,300 WPA access points, for, uh, 45 WEPs, a bunch of opens, and a whole lot of no-names, which are probably corporate networks. Um, this was not hard at all to do. It was really trivial. I was using uh, Kali Linux on this box, which had the native support for the Wi-Fi card, uh, and then uh, a little bit of Python to scrape the XML data and get it into a KML form, like a, a GIS data form. Um, the real point of this, and this is the point that I would even say to any red teamers, these stickers are magical. Um, I could do things like go into the expo center and not have to pay to park. And I think in lar larger corporate environments, I would be, I'd be willing to bet or guarantee that most rideshare drivers or anybody with this sticker in a decent modern car could probably get farther than they should. Um, and also, I will say from the red team perspective, you're only going to get rides from your current area. So get the app, set it up, turn it on, go through the background checks. They're pretty trivial. Uh, it's just scanning some documents and sending to them. But then if you know you're near a large corporate campus, you could throw whatever you want in the trunk and nobody's going to be any of the wiser. You can get a badge reader six inches away from somebody's back if you wanted to. And you can make some money doing it. Um, <laughs> so. Um, one of my initial ideas, which I backed off from because of some legal implications, was to be a shark in the middle and was to use a uh, Wi-Fi pineapple to do uh, possible credential theft. Or my idea was, was to, use, to use the Wi-Fi pineapple to uh, basically grab the wi interrupt the signal from people's phones with Wi-Fi and basically give them a stop, turn off your Wi-Fi now page. Um, wasn't 100% clear on the legal ramifications of that, so I stopped short of it, but I wanted to put it in the slide anyways because it's something that's entirely possible that you could do in the car. So from the, some of the privacy recommendations are pretty simple stuff. It's really basic OPSEC stuff, you know. Uh, from the writer's perspective, there's nothing saying that you need to go directly to your home. You could pick a separate location and then walk from there if it's a relatively safe neighborhood. Um, the companies themselves have understood what the, some of these dangers are, and now I think both Lyft and Uber allow you to share your ride with a friend. I highly recommend that you do that. And I'm not saying that any of these platforms are dangerous, and I'll go into that in a moment. Um, but it's a great feature, and it gives people a wonderful peace of mind. Um, personally, when I drive, my, uh, my wife likes to act as dispatch, and uh, even if I'm in a Taco Bell drive through for too long, she'll call me and ask me what's wrong. Uh, <laughs> Uh, from the writer's perspective, avoid personal discussions. I, I love engaging people in them just to see what I can get out of them. Uh, you'd be surprised the number of people that don't try to wear seat belts in a ride share. Uh, I have a more modern car, so if you're in the front seat, the alarm is obnoxious. Uh, and I'm going to require it. I haven't had to pull over yet, but I've had to strongly convince strong people to put their seat belts on. Um, Backseat drive also. Pay attention to where you're going. You know, um, Don't assume that the directions that the driver is following or correct, or he has your best interests in heart. Um, this is, it is a service that you are paying for by the time and by the mile. So there are, there are, there are situations where a driver can take a longer route just to run up the fare a little bit. Um, as, as a rideshare driver, we hate short trips. So anytime there's a short trip, if you can find a way to, 
to cheese a little bit of extra space or mileage or time out of it, you probably will to avoid the minimum rate that you're going to make. And then, you know, um, and from the renter's perspective, you know, be, be respectful. It's not your car. I've had to lecture people multiple times about throwing trash out of the car. You would think in the 21st century we wouldn't have to do this. And it's also very similar from the driver's perspective. Um, I would use a different phone. I didn't when I started. I totally would now just to keep anything that is truly personal that's mine that has, you know, your entire life on it away from anybody else. Um, you know, share your rides. Uh, try to avoid the personal discussions. From the driver's perspective, make sure you're in good working order to drive your car. Um, I've learned that you can make the experience a lot better if you're a tour guide. You know, try to try try to entertain people. You know, and also it's your car. If you don't like them, kick them out. So these headlines are big, uh, and they're mostly overblown. Uh, you'll see them. Now, what's most interesting is the one that says number of deaths. This comes from a website that's called whosdrivingyou.com. It is 100% a hit piece put on by the taxi industry. Um, all they do is list all the bad things that Uber drivers have ever done. They don't say anything about the bad things that taxi drivers have ever done. So, uh, you, and you're going to get that filter with the media, and they love picking on rideshare drivers. So, who's more dangerous? I really truly believe that sharks are still more dangerous than than Uber than rideshare drivers. Uh, you know, last year, 88 attacks, five fatalities, possible 16 fatalities in uh, Uber drivers for uh, 2017. So, and that is it. That's my short and sweet talk on rideshare. Any any questions? Uh, yes, I think the worst tip I ever got was uh, or tried to get is someone tried to give me half of a 50 gallon bag full of bagels, like a trash bag, like they'd just come from a bakery and like, hey, do you want some bagels? And I'm like, no, I don't want any bagels. Um, I would say, and the thing is, is from from most aspects, all my riders have been pretty good. You know, I've never had to down, I never had to downgrade anyone, and I never was uh, downgraded myself. Um, and I think that's where, I think that's where the danger in the platform may be as we go forward is, is, is we are building a, we are using this as our own social credit with each other. And it, it, if you haven't seen Black Mirror, I highly recommend you go find the episode where they're talking about the rating system that we're starting to use in our everyday lives. And it's going, and you know, it affects Yelp, it affects us, us rideshare drivers. And I think as time goes on, you're going to see and see more judgments based on that. Maybe not things that you can see, but they'll be there. That is yeah. up your time and not right, now. right, and I don't, and I don't think that we're that far from that. Not from the government side, but from the corporation side, because if there are truly bad people using these platforms, at some point, these companies and their competition are going to have to communicate with each other about these bad apples. And in sharing that data, they're going to share a lot more data with each other. They'll be careful initially how they do it, but. You know, it's taken them four years to understand how privacy starts to work with these platforms. You know, uh, at least one rideshare company held an event for the press where they showed cars driving in real time with people's full names on it. And it took members of the press to stop them and go, this isn't correct, you should not be doing this. So that's, that's my spiel. Any other questions? Sorry. What's that? Where you said that you don't get the real phone number anymore for the passenger. I know that was a problem for a while where certain uh, ride share drivers would call email passengers after they dropped them off. Um, I think with the two major platforms, that uh, it, that is correct now, uh, for at least from my research. Um, I have not driven for Lyft. I've only driven for Uber. Uh, and I, I don't speak for Uber or any other company in, in these statements, but I have noticed that they are. They are fake. It's only because, you know, I, I worked an event with a lot of out-of-town people, and all the area codes are 502, and I'm like, well, this isn't possibly true. You know, like, <laughs> these people can't all have Kentucky numbers. So, go ahead. Did you come across anybody who was doing any sort of, you know, red team fuckery with this at all when you were doing research that it was going a little further than you were wanting to? Uh, no. Actually, the, the kernel for this talk started with one of my passengers who took an Uber ride 
that cost about six times more than it should have and then woke up the next morning and, um, as she stated, didn't have any money left in her PayPal account. And they ripped about $380 off from her. Now, it, a story told to me, but the person would have no reason to really make this up per se. It's, it's not sensational enough to be truly entertaining. Um, and I don't know that the rideshare driver necessarily attacked their device. It probably was, if I had to guess, would have been you know, publicly available uh, breached credentials could easily be leveraged at that point, you know, because you can go back and look and see who was in your car and scrape out that data. It wouldn't be hard, considering that you can still get the GPS data back and you can see where all your routes are from the application itself. Because so, that, that, a lot of that data is still held on their side. And you don't have to give your full, you don't have to put in your full name in the right share. So it's another quick tip. Now the driver does. What's that? Oh, fair enough. <laughs> I just used it as a, a way to, to make jokes for this talk. So. Right. True. Hmm. Excellent. Well, thank you for coming. Awesome. Thank you.